If you were trapped on a work trip to an isolated campground with a psychotic cartoon character trying to wipe out your entire office, what would you do? This community isn't too happy about having their land stolen by greedy developers, and one of them is about to go on a blood-soaked rampage of revenge. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the mascot killer in the conference. <laughs> These nine municipal workers are on a business trip to a small town in the Swedish countryside. Tomorrow, they'll be breaking ground for a new shopping mall that they've all designed. But what they don't realize is that the locals have other plans. The place where they're spending the night looks more like a campground than a five-star hotel. But the staff try their best to make everyone feel welcome. After taking the keys to the cabins, everyone separates to put away their things, never suspecting that half of them won't live to see sunrise. Meanwhile, the chief Carl is busy trying to cook up some lunch, but has to leave for some more fuel when he realizes that the stove is empty. As he's driving into town, he ends up running over a board full of nails that some idiot left in the middle of the road. He can already see that his tire is completely destroyed, and that's when he hears someone hammering a short distance away. Frustrated, he storms into the forest to give them a piece of his mind. The moment that he gets close, the hammering suddenly goes quiet, and he can't find a trace of anyone there. He starts inspecting some wire that someone's wrapped between the trees, when all of a sudden, the construction worker sneaks up and clubs him in the back of the head, killing him instantly. All right, captains, listen up. Today's voyage is sponsored by World of Warships, the free-to-play naval combat game that's got me hooked. Now, we all know the feeling. You crave the thrill of commanding a legendary battleship, the tactical dance of destroyers, or the rain of hellfire from an aircraft carrier. World of Warships delivers that and more right on your PC. But it's not just about the nostalgia, folks. This game keeps things fresh with new content every month. We're talking new ships, new nations, even epic collaborations like Godzilla vs. Kong, Transformers, and Popeye. And the graphics? <laughs> Forget about it. They've gone and revamped the water effects, making the seas look so real you'll swear you can smell the saltwater spray. Plus, with over 40 unique maps with dynamic weather, every battle feels like a cinematic masterpiece. Speaking of battles, you've got options galore. Choose from history's most iconic war machines. Battleships, destroyers, cruisers, subs, the whole shebang. Lone wolf or team player? World of Warships has your back. Sail solo or join a division with your mates and dominate the seas together. And did I mention? World of Warships is also available on consoles. So grab your controller, raise the Jolly Rancher, and get ready for epic high seas warfare right from your couch. But before you set sail, make sure you hit that link in the description below. It'll take you straight to the download page, and trust me, you don't want to miss out on this watery brawl. But hold on, there's more. During registration, use the code BRAVO to unlock a sweet starter pack. We're talking 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, and a week of premium account time, and even a free ship. That's like starting the game with a fully loaded broadside ready to fire. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description to download World of Warships. Use code BRAVO to grab your loot and prepare to rule the waves. I'll see you out there. Okay, I can already see where this is going, and it looks like these workers are about to have a much bigger problem on their hands than just a late lunch. This guy in the woods is clearly out for blood, and taking out the chief here is only the beginning. Now, to be fair, there really weren't a lot of ways that Carl here could have possibly seen this coming. I mean, the board full of nails lying in the middle of the road was a little suspicious, but it's far from a sure sign that there is a killer on the loose. For all that he knew, the board might have just fallen off from the back of a work truck. He probably should have been more careful to watch where he was driving, but accidents happen, so it makes sense why he wouldn't have immediately gone on the defensive. With the damage done to his car, it made perfect sense to go looking for the builder here. And given the circumstances, he really had no reason other than just being paranoid to suspect that the guy might want to kill him. I guess that if there's one thing we can learn from Carl here meeting his unfortunate end, it's to always be a healthy amount of cautious and to expect the unexpected. But you know who's not being cautious? The workers at their conference. 
They should know that building a shopping mall in a rural town is bound to ruffle some feathers with the locals, who might not be too thrilled about all of this proposed new development. After all, as hard as this might be to imagine, not everyone wants to live in an Americanized community of strip malls, gas stations, and fast food chains as far as the eye can see. In fact, while Carl here was driving, he overheard a news report on the radio talking about a petition opposing the shopping mall that was signed by a majority of the people who live there. With that much local hostility towards the project, if I were one of these workers, then I sure as hell wouldn't want to stick around in town for an extended visit. To make matters even worse, everyone and anyone could know exactly where they're staying because they chose to print this information right on the front cover of the town's newspaper. That's just asking for trouble, and soon they're going to learn the hard way why this was an absolutely terrible idea. While the workers gather back in the conference room for their first meeting, this woman Lena notices something that strikes her as suspicious. It seems like they didn't pay out to a family whose farm was demolished to make room for their project, and she's convinced that she wouldn't have signed off on it if that was the case, saying that someone had to have forged her signature. Trying to keep things under control, the project manager Jonas tells everyone to break for lunch, but the only lunch that they'll be getting is revenge. While the workers take their break, this maintenance guy Roger steals one of their beers and sneaks off to take a break of his own. He's kicking back in a hammock enjoying the view when he hears a branch crack from somewhere behind him, but he makes the very bad choice not to investigate. Suddenly, the killer impales him with a machete straight through the bottom of the hammock, and after wrapping him up with a bunch of rocks to weigh him down, sinks his body into the shallow water at the edge of the lake. Okay, this is bad news for our unsuspecting government workers. It looks like their new worst enemy has officially made his way into the campground. So far, the agricultural assassin here is two for two with killing people before they even know that it's coming. And I don't know if that's better or worse for our future victims. Sure, he may have heard a noise, but he did the bare minimum and at least took a look over his shoulder to see if there was any immediate danger. The sound could have just as easily been a, a squirrel or some other harmless woodland critter, and he had no real reason yet to suspect that somebody was about to crack him open like a cold one. As for the killer, we still don't have any concrete evidence as to who they are or what they could want, but two things are for sure. Whoever it is looks well prepared and they have a plan. They're not just claiming random victims for sport. These are carefully thought out and executed attacks with deliberate attempts to catch the victims by surprise and to carefully hide their bodies once they've been killed, which means that the workers here probably won't ever see the danger coming. Although we don't know their identity yet, so far, both of the weapons that the killer has used have been manual labor tools, further indicating that they're most likely a disgruntled local looking to stop the overdevelopment of their town by making it seem too dangerous for anyone to build there, like uh, the villain from an episode of Scooby-Doo. Now, the main thing that each of these two victims had in common was that they were far away from anyone else at the time that they were killed. This means that, at least for right now, sticking with their group is going to be what saves these workers' lives, even if they're still completely oblivious to the fact that their lives are in any danger at all. They need to be careful, even if they don't realize it yet, but they're never going to expect what happens next. Back at the lodge, Jonas shows up dressed as a cartoonish character named Sooty, who he's planning to introduce as the town's future mascot. As usual, no one besides his two lackeys, Angelica and Kaj, likes the idea, and he childishly storms out of the building, having no clue that Sooty here is about to go on a killing rampage. For now, it's time to start their team building exercises. This lodge employee, Cleo, gathers the workers outside and starts by collecting their phones so that they won't be distracted, before telling them to head back to the cabins and change into more athletic clothing for the next event. Once everyone's properly geared up, Cleo leads them down to the edge of the lake for their first test. The workers are separated into two teams and challenged to quickly build a makeshift raft out of secondhand items. Although he doesn't do much himself, Jonas's team manages to secure the victory. Meanwhile, the killer finally makes his way into camp. After taking the lockbox full of everyone's phones, he puts on the sooty mask for a little extra style. And now the real killing spree can officially begin. 
After a while, the lodge owner Jenny realizes that all of her employees are nowhere to be found. Confused, she goes searching for them all around the building, but when she makes her way down to the basement, she notices that the back door is swinging open, and someone has totally destroyed the Wi-Fi router. Just then, Sooty here emerges from the bathroom. Jenny ducks back into the kitchen and quickly flings a large knife into Sooty's eye. She puts up a good fight though, hitting the killer with anything that she can find as she desperately tries to escape, but it's no use. The moment that she turns to run, Sooty frisbee tosses a frying pan straight into the back of her head. With the woman down, he crouches over her body and finishes her off by bashing her several times in the head. Okay, it looks like this holiday village is officially under new management. Sooty's first two victims didn't have much of a warning, but Jenny here is probably the first one who could have had a different outcome. If only she'd been a bit more paranoid. Just put yourself in her shoes for a minute. Imagine this, you run an isolated campground out in the middle of the countryside and a controversial group of land developers have just arrived to spend the night. Today seems normal, just like any other day, until late in the afternoon, you realize that none of your coworkers are anywhere to be found. Although maybe they're all in the bathroom or something, no reason to panic yet, but that's when you find the back door was left wide open, and someone has smashed up the Wi-Fi router, leaving you with no connection to the outside world. Taking everything at face value, there would probably be nothing to worry about, but add these three seemingly ordinary events together, and anyone who's seen their fair share of horror movies is going to instantly go into fight or flight mode, even if they've got no other reason to suspect that anything could be wrong. Catching on just a moment sooner might have saved her life, but Jenny here never picked up on the red flags. Now, once the fighting started, Jenny did pretty much everything right. She used any weapons that she had at her disposal, but that still wasn't enough to save her life. The only moment where she might have missed an opportunity to turn the tables was during the brief window after he threw the machete at her and got rid of his only weapon. But even still, it would have been awfully dangerous to close the distance since he could have easily turned around and used the knife that was sticking out his mask to finish the job. In this case, it looks like Jenny's best bet would have been to go for the killer's body and legs since the mask was protecting his head. She also should have quickly slammed and locked any doors that she passed through if she had the opportunity and used her superior knowledge of the building's layout to create opportunities for her to escape. She put up one hell of a fight, but in the end, Sooty came out on top, and he proved a valuable lesson in the process. The frying pan always wins. Back out in the woods, Lena decides to sneak away while her coworkers are all distracted and runs back to camp alone to find out for herself what Jonas is really hiding. She makes it back to the campground, well before any of the others, and sneaks into Jonas's cabin through the open window. After digging through his bag, she manages to find his laptop, and sure enough, his mailbox is full of exactly what she was looking for. It turns out that Jonas here had secretly gotten himself a job from a private investment firm and has been deliberately sabotaging the plans for the mall. Thinking fast, she downloads the evidence onto a thumb drive just as the rest of the group returns. Realizing that their phones are gone, Cleo quickly tries to play it off like this is still part of the team building challenges before running back to the lodge in search of the other employees. There seems to be no trace of anyone around until she nearly slips in a puddle of blood on the kitchen floor. The trail leads Cleo to the freezer, and when she opens it, she finds Jenny's body hanging from a meat hook. She turns around to run for her life, only to crash into the killer. He takes a swing at her with his machete, but luckily, it gets stuck in a pipe overhead, buying her a short chance to escape. Seizing the opportunity, Cleo makes a break for the front door, but it looks like Sooty has locked her in. She retreats into the conference room as he takes wild swings at her with a huge mallet. She manages to hold her own for a moment, but her luck eventually runs out, and Sooty catches her with a swing that knocks her off of her feet, before standing over her and brutally finishing the job. Okay, if before, Jenny should have at least been a little suspicious. Then Cleo here is the first person who should have really seen this coming. I mean, who finds a bloody trail like that and doesn't immediately think that their life could be in danger? A couple drops of blood here and there, I'd understand. This is a kitchen after all. But you don't have to be CSI Miami over here to see that this was clearly the type of trail that's made by somebody dragging a body. 
best case scenario, she was about to run into a bear that was tweaking off of illegal substances. And worst case, you have a serial killer on the loose. Either way, if you see a blood trail like that, then it's time to grab a weapon before investigating. Like one of those knives that were hanging on the wall right behind her, or the torch lighter on the counter. Now with that being said, Cleo here actually put up a good fight, and with a few small changes to her strategy, she just might have survived. As soon as the fight started, she could have kicked Sooty here between the legs, quickly retreated back to the freezer, and held the door shut from the inside. The thick door would make it hard for him to break through. Unlike the others, she also still had her phone, which gives her a pretty big advantage. During the chase, Cleo had a small window of opportunity between Sooty getting his machete stuck in the pipe and before he got the mallet to fight back while he was unarmed. The door leading into the kitchen swings both directions, so after she ran out, she could have quickly turned around and plowed back through it, using the door to knock him off of his feet and then jump him with kitchen weapons while he's down. As a matter of fact, it would have been a wise choice to slam any doors that she passed through and try to lock him out if she had time. Cleo knew that her best chance was to find a way to escape, but when she tried the front door, Sooty here had already locked it. This meant that she needed to at least injure him enough that he couldn't keep up the chase before finding herself another way out. But as you can see, that's easier said than done. Let's take a look at Sooty's choice of weapon for a moment. That giant mallet has a lot of reach and power. One good hit, and you're toast. On the flip side, it takes a lot of energy to swing and has a long recovery time between strikes. Now I know that Cleo's whole thing was about getting away from technology, but maybe if she spent less time playing patty cake out in the woods and more time playing Elden Ring, then she would have known that it was time to break out some dodge rolls. As soon as he took a swing, she could have moved in close and tried to shoulder him off balance. With any luck, she could have knocked him off of his feet and then gone for that submission, or at least bumped right past him and escaped out of the room. The worst part about all of this is that the bloodshed is going to be for nothing now that we know that the mall was never meant to be finished in the first place. But Sooty here doesn't care about office politics. He's on a mission for revenge. Oh, and it's just getting started. While everyone's busy partying in the hot tub, Lena shows up and gives her friends Amir and Nadja the signal that she wants to talk. Excusing themselves from the group, the three of them head back to her cabin where she brings them up to speed on Jonas and his people's secret backroom deals. Oh, they're furious, and as the others separate to get ready for dinner, Lena comes back to the hot tub and confronts him. At first, Jonas here tries to play dumb. But when Lena doubles down, he tells her that he'd rather discuss the matter in private, to which she agrees. In his cabin, Lena tells Jonas that she's on to his scheme and knows all about how he planned to sell them out to advance his own career. Realizing that he's cornered, Jonas makes a last ditch effort to butter her up by offering Lena a job at the development firm, but she sees right through his obvious lie and refuses to take the deal. Taking out the thumb drive, she reveals that she's already downloaded all of the evidence and tells Jonas that if he doesn't come clean by morning, then she'll be taking her story to the police. Meanwhile, Kaj and Annette are still chilling out by the hot tub. When they notice Sooty walking towards them, and for some reason he's revving up a small boat propeller. Too wasted for his own good, Kaj here still thinks that it's only Jonas in the costume, and slices open his neck with the spinning blades. Somehow he's still alive, but instead of trying to help, Annette runs for her life as Sooty cuts Kaj to ribbons, and wanders off looking for his next victim. Okay, this guy was a total idiot. Hey Kaj, you f***ed up. Look, even if you think that it's just your boss in a costume, you have to be pretty damn stupid to let somebody come up and kill you with something as clunky as a boat propeller. I get that he was a little buzzed after throwing back a couple brewskis in a hot tub, but if he'd been paying even the slightest bit of attention, then he would have caught on to the fact that something wasn't quite right. Let's see here, compared to the last time that you've seen him, What's different? Well, Sooty's face is now covered in blood for one, and his costume has completely changed from cartoon farmer to real life ax murderer. Also, if he'd been listening before, then he would have overheard that Jonas couldn't find the mascot head when they got back to camp. Plus, he'd just left his cabin to get changed for dinner, so why would he come back dressed like that? 
The red flags were right in his face, and picking up on any of them might have bought him a chance to escape. But he helped forge important contracts and backstabbed the farmer and everyone else on his team for personal gain. So in the end, it looks like he got what he had coming. Now, what stands out here is that this was the first kill with a witness, which means that someone finally knows that they're being systematically hunted down. If I were Annette, I'd run to the nearest cabin right away and try to regroup with as many of the others as I could. This way, everyone will be on the same page about what's going down. They can work together to possibly find a way to call for help, and being in a group makes it significantly harder for the killer to pick you off one at a time. By grouping up, it turns the situation from you being the only target to having seven other meat shields, I mean co-workers, that Sooty might go after first, dramatically reducing the odds of you ending up on the business end of a pointing object. Of course, you can always go back to the hideout by yourself plan if and when things start to go horribly wrong, but for now, staying with the group is going to be her best chance for survival. Clueless to the danger, Angela here decides to head over to the lodge to find out why dinner is running so late, but she notices a strange light coming from the conference room and walks in to see that the place is an absolute murder scene, with several of Cleo's teeth still lying on the floor. Panicking, Angela runs back out of the building, where she comes face to face with Sooty himself, and punches her square in the face, knocking her out cold. Sooty wraps a rope around her neck and hoists Angela straight up to the top of the camp flagpole. By now, the others have heard the commotion, but by the time that they get there, it's already too late to stop him. As Sooty turns his attention towards them, everyone immediately runs for their lives, fleeing to different parts of the camp. Okay, no wonder they needed some team building exercises. Because these so-called teammates just went every man for himself faster than when the police show up at a high school party. Now, if you've been watching the channel, then you'll know that I have no problem taking that approach when the situation calls for it. But in this case, this was actually their worst possible choice. Instead, what they needed to do here was work together. They had Sooty outnumbered six to one, and this was the only time that they're going to get such a significant advantage. To be fair, they may not all be the best fighters, but they could have easily overwhelmed him with pure numbers. Throw a few weapons in the mix, like the hatchet that was in the stump right next to Lena. It wouldn't have even been a fair fight, and it wouldn't have even been a fight. Also, it might have been hard to see from their angle, but Sooty actually had no weapons at this point. They could have easily taken him on and ended this right here, but they made a huge mistake by splitting up. Lena especially made a bad call here because now the only person who she has around is Jonas, and he just straight up sucks. Although this does give her the chance to sacrifice him if things get bad. This whole scene brings to mind the saying that you don't have to be faster than the bear to get away. You just have to run faster than the guy next to you. And that's why it's better to always stick together with the largest possible group. At this point, Lena needs to run and just keep running until she's far out of sight, and then either find a place to hide out or try to get to the nearest place where there might be some help. They did just drive out there this morning, so they should have some idea of what's around nearby. But if it's nothing but farmland for miles around, then this is what they get for having their conference out in the middle of nowhere. Either way, odds are that the guy won't choose to come after you alone instead of going back to camp for the others. So, even though it's not the ideal outcome, I'd focus my attention now on losing him somewhere in the forest and be hoping for the best. In all the chaos, Jonas here is in the lead, blindly running for his life. When he crashes headfirst into a razor-thin wire between two trees, Lena quickly stops to pick him back up, and the two of them press on as Sooty closes in right behind them. They manage to make it to the edge of the lake and set out into the water aboard the raft that they'd built earlier in the afternoon. It's not the cleanest getaway, but they're able to lose Sooty for now. Lena still has one more unhinged maniac to deal with. No sooner have they gotten to the middle of the lake than Jonas here abruptly stops paddling and starts demanding that Lena give him the flash drive. She's in total disbelief, and with no other option, she reluctantly decides to hand it over. Just then, Jonas leans forward and kicks her overboard, forcing Lena to swim back to shore. Terrified and freezing, Lena starts to make her way back towards the camp. 
when out of the darkness, a hatchet comes flying at her through the air. It's Sooty, and as she runs for her life, she ends up falling right into a pit full of spikes where he's left the cook's dead body, and thinking quickly, decides to pull one out of the ground to use as a weapon. When Sooty leans over the edge of the pit, Lena jabs at him with the pointed stick and buying herself a chance to climb back up to the surface. Moments later, she's taking cover behind a large rock when she notices a flashlight coming through the trees. It turns out that her friend Amir came looking for her, but he ends up getting tangled in a bunch of wires. Just as Sudi is about to find him, Lena grabs him from behind, quickly shutting off his light, and the two of them sneak away into the woods. Okay, Lena may have managed to get away, but she missed out on a lot of important opportunities here. First off, she obviously should have left Jonas for dead because he definitely would have done the same thing to her. While Sudi was busy dealing with him, she could have paddled across the lake by herself and been halfway to safety by now. But instead, she circled back to help him and almost paid the ultimate price. Trusting Jonas on the raft was also a huge mistake. Lena should have seen that kick coming from a mile away and tried to betray him first instead by faking him out when she was reaching for the hard drive and then shoving him overboard into the lake. She even had a chance to take Sooty out while he was down after she climbed out of the pit. That could have been the moment to finish him off right there, but she made the terrible choice to run away instead. Now, Amir may have almost blown their cover, but his flashlight gives me an idea. Since it's also dark in the woods, they could use the light to lure the killer into a trap. Just set the light up somewhere as bait and then ambush him when he comes to check it out. It's risky, but it might be their only chance to get the jump on him. And it's always better to fight on your own terms than to give him any more chances to catch you by surprise. Meanwhile, the others decide to barricade themselves in the main lodge. With no one coming to save them, they decide to arm themselves with any weapons that they can find. Once they're all ready for a fight, this old guy Torbjorn says that they need to come up with a plan. Nadja wants to make a break for Jonas's cabin to get the keys to their van, but the other two refuse to leave the safety of the lodge, forcing the woman to set off on her own. Fortunately, Nadja makes it to Jonas's cabin without any trouble. She's even able to find the keys to the van, but just when she does, Sooty crashes in through the window, grabbing the woman by her hair. Nadja reaches for a large pair of scissors and manages to cut herself free, but the victory is short-lived. An instant later, the killer circles around to the front door, but he accidentally knocks out the lights when he reaches back to take a swing. For a moment, Nadja and the killer battle it out in complete darkness. Suddenly, the fighting stops, and Nadja emerges as the winner, but Sooty chases after her. Nadja runs back to the lodge with the keys to the van, but unfortunately, Sooty is already one step ahead of her. While they watch through the window, he quickly sets fire to the van's gas tank, destroying the vehicle in a burst of flame and taking away their only means of escape. And that's when they hear someone knocking at the back door. Terrified, the three of them go to check it out, ready to fight for their lives, but it turns out to only be Amir and Lena, while the killer retreats into the woods to patch himself up. Annette finally comes out of hiding, only to run right into Jonas. Horrified, the two of them take shelter in her cabin, and she helps him put some temporary stitches in his head wound. Annette speculates that the killer could be a disgruntled former co-worker, admitting that she's still friends with the man and had told him where they'd be holding their conference. Furious, Jonah here has finally had enough and decides that he needs to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. Outside, Jonas finds a moped hidden nearby and hops on just as Sooty comes back for another round. He speeds away while Annette clings on from behind dragging her several yards down the dirt road until he's finally able to shake her off, leaving her for dead as he disappears into the woods. As Annette picks herself up from the ground, she turns around to see Sooty already closing in. Thinking that it's really her friend, the woman starts off trying to reason with him, but when she pulls off his mask, she quickly realizes that she doesn't know the man at all. Without saying a word, he buries a sickle into the top of the woman's skull. Down the road, Jonas is driving so fast that he doesn't notice another spiked board. He hits it going at full speed, bursting his tires and sending him flying over the bridge into the ice cold stream below. Back at the lodge, the remaining survivors start discussing what they should do next. While they're figuring it out, Amir notices a blood-soaked newspaper on the floor and finally realizes that the killer must actually be the son of the farmer whose land they stole for their project. 
and that's when Lena remembers that the campground's zipline will take them across the lake to safety, agreeing that it's their best chance to escape. The others arm themselves with whatever weapons that they can find, and set off as a group towards the top of the hill. They're walking through the forest with their flashlights out, trying their best to stay quiet, when suddenly, they see Sooty rushing towards them from the darkness. Instead of sticking together, everyone immediately panics and starts running for their lives, but they don't make it far before Nadja gets her foot caught in a bear trap, and the other two coldly leave her for dead. Sooty stands over her about to claim his next victim. Nadja grabs a sharp stick from the ground and stabs him directly in the eye. Badly injured, the killer stumbles backwards over a cliff, where Nadja manages to get herself free. Lena and Amir finally make it to the zipline and quickly put on their gear. She's incredibly nervous, but they have no other choice, and Amir reassures her that it's going to be all right. When they reach the top, Amir hooks them both in, and after gathering their courage, they jump from the platform and start zipping across the lake. The plan seems to be working, but when they're halfway down the line, Amir notices that something is horribly wrong. The killer is one step ahead of them once again, and has already booby-trapped their landing zone with a dozen huge wooden spikes. At the last moment, Amir spins them both around, sacrificing himself so that Lena can escape. Okay, these idiots just blew another opportunity to finish the fight, all because they can't figure out how to work as a team. They had Sudi heavily outnumbered once again, so they needed to stand their ground and fight while they had the chance. In the end, Amir made a heroic choice, but even with him as a shield, Lena here could have been easily killed too, meaning that his sacrifice would have been for nothing. They were still all the way out over the middle of the lake when he saw the spikes. What he should have done was reach up and quickly unclip both of them from the zip line, allowing them to safely fall into the water and swim the rest of the way to shore. Also, when they were grabbing their zip lining gear, why not take the helmets too? This might seem silly, but not only would the helmets give them extra protection in the next fight, but they could also use one as a decent weapon if they swing it. In a situation like this, you have to take advantage of anything that you can, and passing up a chance at some free head armor is just a wasted opportunity to make yourself that much harder to kill. A short distance away, Lena finds the killer's canoe with the box full of their phones, and as luck would have it, her phone still works, allowing her to get in contact with the police. Back at the camp, Torbjorn and Ava are hiding out inside the lodge when they hear someone knocking at the front door. Torbjorn grabs a weapon and cautiously goes over to check it out until suddenly, the killer stabs through the door with a chainsaw. As Sooty kicks his way in, Torbjorn puts up his dukes and gets ready to battle it out, buying Ava a chance to escape. Luckily, the killer's chainsaw is out of gas, but even still, it isn't much of a fair fight. Sooty throws the old man into the cafeteria, determined to go out like a true gangster. Torbjorn only laughs in his face, but that's when Ava comes in swinging with a scythe like an absolute maniac. This unexpected onslaught forces Sooty to retreat, and Ava quickly barricades the door so that he can't get back in. Torbjorn here looks like he just did 12 rounds with Mike Tyson, but he's still holding on, and what's more, he isn't about to run. Sooty's about to find out that he picked on the wrong senior citizen because Torbjorn wants revenge. Okay, who knew Torbjorn here was so badass? 20 years ago, he probably could have soloed this maniac. There's no denying that Torbjorn is a straight up menace for squaring up with a guy wielding a chainsaw, but with that being said, although he's hungry for a rematch, he's already taken enough bumps at this point and doesn't need to be getting into another fight. Instead of going out looking for a fight, what he and Ava should do right now is stay put and wait for help, especially because it gives you the opportunity to set the battlefield up in a way that works to your own advantage. This could mean using furniture to create barricades. They're lucky enough to be stuck in the kitchen, so they should have plenty to eat and access to water, which means that they can hold out for weeks if it comes to that. But these old folks aren't gonna wait to be reduced. They're about to hunt this guy down. Arming themselves with just weapons, they begin sweeping the lodge, searching for any signs of the killer. Just then, Sooty attacks Ava from behind, sending the two of them right through a window and out of the building. 
Ava shakes him off and runs for her life, but Sooty grabs a barbecue fork and flings it into her back, cornering her. The killer stands over Ava with an electric drill, about to drive it straight into her head, but the fight's not over yet. All of a sudden, Torbjorn unplugs the drill and ignites the man's head with a torch lighter, cackling with glee as he bursts into flames. Despite all of this damage, Sooty manages to put his head out in a nearby bucket of water and picks up a weather vane to finish the job. He stands over Torbjorn and Ava, about to deliver the killing blow, when out of nowhere, Nadja rushes in from behind and slices his head clean off with a shovel. To their relief, Sooty is finally dead, but there's still one more psycho on the loose. Standing on the side of the river, Lena watches as the police speed by towards the camp. Suddenly, Jonas here comes sprinting out of the forest and tackles her straight into the water. It's an instant battle to the death, and for a moment, it looks like Jonas might have the upper hand. But Lena turns the tables with a few well-placed strikes, ending the fight by tearing off Jonas's scalp with her bare hands. As they're being loaded into ambulances, Lena and Nadja exchange quiet smiles. She's grateful just to be alive, but one thing's for sure. Next year, Lena's skipping the company retreat. But what would you do if you showed up to some weird-ass conference out in the middle of nowhere for a ridiculous subject anyway, and people around you just started to get killed? Would you wait around and try to figure out what was going on, or would you get the hell out of there? I think you know what I would do but let us know down in the comments below what you would do. Thanks for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this. Yeah, have a damn good day.